Hello everybody and welcome to the Nexus Gaming Series. I am Jason, and today we're bringing you a Division D West match here between the Bone Boys and Divine Nine Black. And since we're running a little bit late, we're just going to jump straight on into the game. Both teams are ready to go and we're going to be going to this best of two series. We've got Divine Nine Black selecting their first map here as Infernal Shrines and game number two is actually not going to be played out on Cursed Hollow. Let me go ahead and fix that. Uh, so game number one is Infernal Shrines. And game number two is actually going to be played out on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Uh, just to quickly go over the coin toss for you guys, it was won by Divine Nine Black. They elected to ban... Or won by Bone Boys, actually. No. It was won by Divine Nine Black, but they selected... First pick, first ban. So uh, Sky Temple was then banned out by Bone Boys. Braxis Holdout banned out by D9 Black. And then um, Bone Boys selected Tomb of the Spider Queen, which is the map we go to now in game number two, which is what has me so confused all the time. And then Divine Nine Black selected Infernal Shrines as our map number one. So first pick, first ban is going over to Bone Boys here for this map. And we do see Asbadan and Garrosh, the first two bands out here. Asbadan, of course, very popular in this current meta. And White Mane going to be banned out, despite the fact that White Mane is still not available for play. But that's okay. We're just going to let that one go. No big deal there. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing in the rules to say it can't ban it, I suppose. It's just double banned now. We're going to see Yorel be the ban out for D9 Black. I am going to go ahead and message tastefully, though. Anytime you're ready. Crusade calls. I, I shall do what I must. All right, so Johanna and Alex Traza are going to be picked up here for Divine Nine Black. Rainer picked up first for the Bone Boys, and a pretty constant in in the game lately has been Rainer's uh, involvement, both as a early ban and as a uh, potential early pick in these drafts very good sustain and just in general he's kind of difficult to kill nowadays with the uh improvement of his self heal being controlled by the player rather than by a certain percentage of health to trigger it um alex Traza, of course is very good in the game right now as well she's moved up quite heavily in the meta with her newly reformed life binder heroic uh leoric and deckard gonna be picked up here by the bone boys so wanting to make sure they get Deckard before this next ban out phase so they don't face a tough support chokehold. It's a pretty good call on their part. And we are now also going to see the Muradin banned out. So with having Johanna on their team already, they want to limit some of the stronger tank options. They've already gotten rid of Garrosh. Uh, Muradin also pretty decent on this map. He's got He's got okay wave clear with a thunderclap. It's not it's not the best, but it's not bad. Meanwhile, uh, Sonya going to be banned out over on the side of the Bone Boys. They may have done some research on my good buddy Siege and how much he loves his Sonya. The Haka and Jaina are going to be the follow-up here for D9 Black. So, uh, Dahaka to answer that Leoric in the solo lane, uh, which is a tough matchup head-to-head -head for Dahaka um, with, you know, with that constant Drain Hope ability. Though, of course, Dahaka also has some decent self-sustain in lane as well and does have the advantage of that global. So, Leoric's got to rotate maybe a little bit earlier 
to get the same kind of value on these objectives. And uh, Diablo, no surprise there, coming out for Bone Boys. Diablo, probably the next strongest tank that hadn't already been taken out from the previous bans and picks. So a um, lot of good terrain for Diablo to charge people into on this map. Hanzo going to be picked up as the uh, secondary range damage dealer here. He's got good potential wave clear and shrine clear. So it'll be interesting to see what he can do. And Tyke is going to be picked up. So with Leo and Diablo on the other side and not a whole lot of dive potential, we are going to see Tyke coming out. All right, so we are loading in here to game number one, which is going to be on Infernal Shrine. Should be interesting to see how these teams play. This is the first game of the season for Divine Nine Black. Of course, our sister team over on Divine Nine. So looking forward to seeing how these guys perform. Meanwhile, uh, we have uh, in the standings right now for Div D West... Um, taking a look at Bone Boys, they are currently 0 and 2 uh, listed. But I'm not sure if maybe they just have an unreported match or if they still have one more to play. We're getting very close to the end of the first phase here, so we'll have to see if that is indeed going to be uh, the case here. But for right now, it looks like they are 0 and 2 to start. And Divine Nine Black, actually with a double header, they have another game coming up in about an hour against Team Skyarc. So we're hoping to get this done nice and quick for them so they can make it on time for that match. So we'll do it as quickly as we can, but it appear we may have a potato. A little potato problem. Take a quick opportunity to thank everybody who's hosting the channel currently. We've got Norian, Consort, Moist Weenus, Nexus Commentaries, Nibbler Bit, Archangel, Ouija, Swing Time, Tempest Hots, and Ice Fox. Emily, thank you very much for the host, guys. We appreciate that so much. Especially the other members of the NGS family keeping it in-house. Gotta love it. But we are loaded in here to a game numero uno on the left we've got the bone boys we've got arcanaut on the diablo chaos killer going to be playing the deckard some scrub playing the hanzo taste rancid playing leoric and captain bobo going to be playing the rainer i'm sure no no relation to professor bobo meanwhile on the right we've got divine nine black we've got doggo playing the Jaina. we've got um nathan and dj 20 on the Dahaka. Siege playing the Tychus. Uh, Mystic Spank playing the Alex Raza. And Summer Ash playing the Johanna. Alright, so right away both teams going to commit most of their resources to mid. We do have Leoric up in the top lane. Of course, Dahaka can and will burrow up to the top to avoid losing much of that soap. And for right now, it looks like both teams are going to uh, start to work on that four-man rotation as they do go ahead and head towards the bot lane. Captain Bobo and go ahead and use that penetrating round to give himself just a little bit of space as he rotates to the bot. Four-man remaining here in mid for Bone Boys, so... Members of Divine Nine Black are going to have to rotate back up or risk losing quite a bit of that soak, but they clear pretty quickly. They've got some solid wave clear with their comp at the moment. And they're going to hard rotate in here and find themselves a Lord of Terror. Turn is real, but it's Diablo that gets the worst end of that. It looks like most of those minions were in range as they were getting killed on the wall, so not too bad of an XP differential there 
for D9 Black. However, they were not able to find the kill on Diablo. Very tanky. We'll see Summer Ash going ahead and popping the uh, Unstoppable, avoiding that scroll of sealing there from Chaos Killer. But for right now, the poke war continues. And right now, it looks like Divine Nine Black going with the more traditional rotation game while Bone Boy is remaining in lane and just soaking in a 1 through 1 rotation. Or it should say non rotation. They're not rotating at all. So it does mean that they're getting just a little bit more XP. A couple of minions will die here and there in the crossfire from each minion as they do this. Arcanaut, though, is in a little bit of trouble. Siege getting a lot of damage out there with that trait. And Captain Bobo once again rotating in dangerously. The Condemn is going to come down. Looks like for now, not quite enough follow up from D9 Black to get themselves a kill. No camp started so far, so both teams just looking for the XP. Still pretty even overall. I feel like anybody's really lost too much of anything. Both top laners just playing very, very safe, very passive, getting their XP. Camp has been. St uh, has been looked at over here for Bone Boys, but they're going to go ahead and back off it. Y9 Black actually going to take a peek and see if they can figure out where the Bone Boys are indeed hiding. Summer Ash is going to find himself a Leo. Siege laying down some damage onto him with that minigun. But for now, it looks like both teams are just going to go ahead and posture towards the shrine. Summer Ash just come in with that Condemn, and a very early dragon going to be popped here. For MJ. The question is, what can they do with this while they have the advantage of this dragon being up? And right now, Bone Boys are just playing passive, not worrying too much about it. I'm just going to wait for that cooldown to be down and then look to engage. They do push the minion wave into the wall, so they're going to deny some soak here as they go in right away. Huge scroll of sealant. Coming in from Chaos, and that is going to be a kill. Onto the Alexstrasza. Summer Ash getting low, trying to peel for the team, but also going to get sniped down by some scrub. Now that's the most demoralizing. When you know it's some scrub that took you down, that just doesn't feel good. It's going to be a 2 nothing here for the side of Bone Boys. They're going to be able to capture this top objective. No problem. Going to be the Frozen Punisher. Marching into top. Meanwhile, Divine Nine Black gonna rotate out to lane, try and get a little bit of extra side soak. Let's actually go ahead and bring up these talents for you guys so you guys can check out what these guys are building towards. Full uh, full sca uh, scatter shot build here for Hanzo. Not even electing to take the Q talent at level four for the explosive ar arrows on the. Uh... It is pretty good clear on the shrine. But overall, you do get a lot of extra um, potential damage in camps and against enemy punishers also from that uh, scatter arrow. So benefits to both builds for sure. Still pretty, still pretty standard to build the uh, scatter shot at one and seven, either way. Meanwhile, that uh, is going to be bigger. They are so. The members of Divine Nine Black are going to be looking towards isolating one hero, lowering them very quickly, and getting a quick finish with that Jaina burst damage. But thus far, have not been able to execute that. Alex Straza going into a full circle of healing build. So looking for those globes. In fact, multiple members of Divine Nine Black looking for globes early in this game. They've got three different globe quests. And you can see that, that that is what they're doing with the rotation game. They're up to uh, all of them into well into the teens now for their respective quests. About a level lead right now for the side of the Bone Boys. They are going to be looking to try and get the level 10 well before this next objective pops in the bot lane. Meanwhile, the members of Divine Nine Black starting a camp has not been scouted out yet by the Bone Boys, but they are hanging around in this area. Summer Ash kind of playing the ward. Going to be getting yet another globe there off of the camp, getting ever closer to finishing those quests. Meanwhile, Diablo 
is able to get that 100th stack for uh, for his soul quest. And right now, both teams just kind of feeling each other out, playing pretty passive. Getting the camps on their own respective sides. Level 10s will be picked up here for the side of the Bone Boys. Still plenty of time, though, for Divine Nine Black to pick up their level 10s before the next objective. They're also going to go ahead and quickly grab the camp. Again, that wave clear and uh, potential siege damage they have is pretty high on their squad, so they are able to clear that before the members of Bone Boys can really hope to get in to counter that. Captain Bobo up here soaking while we have Leo in the bot lane. Oh, meanwhile, the charge in by Arcanaut. Very aggressive, but they are starting to turn. Level 10s still not here for Divine Nine Black, but they will find themselves a kill on the Diablo. It's going to reset the souls, and now level 10s are going to come in. It's a one-for-one -one exchange, but those level 10s might be a little bit too late here, especially with Dia with uh, Dahaka split, but somehow the rest of the members of Divine Nine Black make it out. All five members are here for the Bone Boys. Diablo coming back a little bit quicker with those souls, but I guarantee he'd rather have had the longer death counter and still have those ten souls available for this objective. Now all five members of Divine Nine Black are up. They are heading in towards the mid. They're going to be able to contest on this objective in time. The only question is how much of a lead will Bone Boys have already picked up? They're almost halfway, but in comes the ring. It's only going to catch the Diablo, but along with that comes the Dragon Queen. And so the members of Bone Boys are going to try to back up. The, the shield comes out. Oh, and a huge tongue there from Ta on a Taste Rancid. Oh, man. From Nathan. That was huge. Right now, they are catching up. We're going to see... Actually, it's not going to be the Life Binder. It's going to be the Searing Flame coming out. They are clearing this pretty well, but the Lightning Breath comes out on the other side from Arcanaut. Doggle getting very low. Going to have to try to back up, but that is a Genji he's trying to run... Or a Hanzo he's trying to run away from. So, massive amounts of range on that. And just like that, Bone Boy has picked themselves up a 3 for nothing exchange and are going to be getting themselves... The uh, the Mortar Punisher pushing in the bot lane. Fort taking quite a lot of damage here. As Dahaka is going to split up to the top lane. Leo, though... Also pressing in the mid lane with the minion waves that had accrued there. They're going to end up getting double fort off of this play. Along with uh, the mid, the, the keep front, or keep, the bottom keep front wall. There we go. Labels, man, I swear. Front wall is going to go down, but it looks like with the Hyperion being no more, they are going to go ahead and back off here. Punisher goes down, and they will immediately rotate to steal away the siege camp. So right now, Bone Boy is playing pretty strong on the macro side of things. Knowing when uh, when to push and when to back off. Keep was going to be a pretty risky play to go for there, so they just back off and start painting the map blue. Taking a look at the heroics here so far. Like, we are going to have March of the Black King coming out for the Leoric, along with Lightning Breath, Hyperion, Lornado, and Dragon's Arrow for the side of Bone Boys. Meanwhile, Divine Nine Black going ahead with the Blessed Shield, Commandeer Odin, Ring of Frost, Searing Flame, and the Isolation. Pretty standard picks across the board, I would say, except for that um, Searing Flame. We've seen quite a lot of Life Binder, especially in conjunction with these high health frontline targets, such as a Johanna or a Dahaka. Even if one of your backline get focused on, 
Uh, though, with the, with the lack of dive potential from Bone Boys, you wouldn't really expect that to be what happens. But, um... Can be used to save a backliner if they are in trouble as well. Tearing Flame is good for AoE damage and good for, uh... Potentially helping clear some of the shrine, but just doesn't get the same value I think as Lifebinder does right now. A lot of people noting that it just seems a little broken how strong that heroic is. But meanwhile, Divine Nine Black looking to maybe catch the members of Bone Boys out in rotation, but very smartly will not rotate in the general direction of where Divine Nine Black was, not wanting to give up that fight before they reach level 16. And D9 Black will be forced to just go back to soaking. They are losing a lot of soak in top, though, as tastes pushing in in the top lane. They may look to try to gank the Leo now, though. Not a very easy gank target. He will walk away. The members of D9 Black go missing. They got a pretty long road to try to get to level 16 here. Meanwhile, Bone Boy is having already cleared up the Bruiser Camp, just waiting to time it up with the activation of the Shrine. They know they got level 16. They know they can play this game nice and slow. No need to rush anything. Nathan is pushing into the bot lane. There is no vision currently on the members of Bone Boys, but... Oh man, they are coming down. He's going to realize this. Of course, Dahaka does have a lot of tools to survive that kind of gank, so it looks like... Bone Boy is not going to rotate too much into it. Meanwhile, that camp is pushing into top. Will easily be able to take down that fort if left unattended. But the question is, will the members of Divine Nine Black go to clear it? Yes, they will. It is pretty much going to concede the shrine, however. But with level 16, it's a tough call whether or not you want to even take that fight on the shrine. It looks like they are going to elect to. They have all of their ults available. But the, all the ults are also available on the other side. Odin popped here early by Seeds, trying to get a little bit of extra damage out to start. And they are going to successfully force Bone Boys off the point. But they already have 30. So, um, we'll have to see if they can catch up fast enough here. Looks like they are posturing to try and push back in. They are waiting out the Odin, which now is down. And here comes the Hyperion as they push in with the Lightning Breath, putting a lot of damage on the front line. They also are able to pick up this Arcane Punisher. Meanwhile, Summer Ash gets charged and taken down. Searing Flame going to come out is only going to really aid the uh, retreat of a couple members here. But actually, Alex has got to be careful. A little bit out in the middle of nowhere here with that Punisher still being available to jump. But we will see Dahaka falling as well. So the front line is now down for Divine Nine Black. The Punisher is baited over the wall. But here comes the Bone Boys pushing in the mid lane. They're going to be taking down that front wall. They're setting their sights onto the mid keep. And this could be the end of the game if Divine Nine Black are not careful. They don't have level 16 yet. This Punisher is about dead. But it uh, looks like right now Bone Boys are discussing it amongst themselves they're trying to decide it looks like they will go ahead and back up for the moment smart decision i think that there's no need to risk you're way ahead in this game you've still got your level 16 talent tier advantage uh to be able to go around the map and force the issue wherever you want tons of soak up here potentially in the top lane you're definitely going to win the race to 20 and if you push into the mid there and you try and take keep, first of all, you've got a Hanzo who's not great at uh, structure damage. The uh, the Rainer's pretty good at it, though. But uh, still, just not, not a ton of siege damage over on the side of Bone Boys. And you run the risk of getting wiped and really letting Divine Nine Black back into this game. So really, it's a question of how many different ways can I lose this game right now? And Bone Boys thought to themselves, well, that's definitely one of them. But they're not going to take the risk. And you can see the siege damage. It takes them an awful long while, even at level 19, 
to take down that fort. And now they're giving a very opportunistic fight here. The Divine Nine Black before level 20 comes out. However, the turn is real and Nathan doing everything he can to try and live. And it's actually Johanna who dies first, but that front line gets melted. And still very healthy are the members of Bone Boys. As Searing Flames is going to come out. It is going to get the three back line out. But once again, those two front line are melted by that incredibly high damage from both Rainer and Hanzo. Leoric also a huge contributing factor to that. And just like that, it's another two for nothing exchange. 10 to one currently on the kill count for the side of the Bone Boys. And they are about to get level 20. I'm gonna go ahead and clear out some of these camps. While the members of Divine Nine Black are down, they're gonna pick up that 20 with the soak in the bot lane. And now they can look to push the issue. We've got a camp pushing in the bot lane. They've got uh they've got the minion wave here with it. They've also got the camp pushing in mid that D9 Black is gonna have to look at trying to clear out here. Now it looks like they will elect to push into the bottom keep. Ring is going to come out here as Divine Nine Black looks to force the engagement. Arcanaut is pretty low. It looks like the members of Bone Boys are going to go ahead and back out. And really just not give them the chance. No reason to fight there. You got the keep that you were looking for. Just go ahead and back it up. Rotate your way up. The enemy team has got lots of stuff to clear off of their keep and their core. Now force them to come fight you in a position where you have a much higher advantage than in the middle of the bot lane. They could fall back to this fort in the top lane. They have a well here that they can tap if they need to. And most importantly, they can be working towards getting this potentially final map objective of the game. A ton of damage coming down onto Summer Ash. Just getting completely blown up. Alex Straza ends up being the first to fall, but the focus fire here from Bone Boys is on point in this matchup as they take down four in a hurry and now Taste Rancid on the chase. Doggle in all kinds of trouble. Gonna hit the ice block, but that is just, that's just uh, delaying the inevitable here. As Divine Nine Black is dominated and in comes the march here from the Bone Boys. They're going to go straight down the mid lane. They're running it down mid. Don't even care about getting the Punisher. They know that they've got the game well in hand. And just like that, on Divine Nine Black's map of choice here, Infernal Shrines, game number one. Going to go over to the Bone Boys. Very well executed game by these guys. They definitely are on the same page. Well-oiled machine. And getting it done quick. We are also going to try and work quickly here. So we'll give you guys a quick snapshot of the stats. Quick snapshot of the talents. And then we are going to go straight on in to setting up game number two. Which is going to be played out on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Go ahead and get our captains invited in here. As these guys got another game that I will also be casting coming up in just a bit. Just 34 minutes, so we want to make sure they that we all make it there in time for that. Oh, not Arcanon. He's... He's definitely over on that side. There we go.
All right. Looks like we got everybody in lobby. Just let me make sure everybody is ready to go. We'll go ahead and give Bone Boys their point on the board. Oh no, we lost somebody. Let's go D West. Yes, welcome Ektar. Thanks for joining us, man. How are you doing tonight? This is this message coming to you from the future. All right, and we got teams ready to go. So we're going to head straight on in to game number two on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Map pick of the Bone Boys. So first pick, first band going over to D9 Black. As they look, try and split tonight. Get themselves a point on the way out. Football is God 60. Bone Boys hype. Now, they were pretty hyped in that first game. They, they performed very well. A lot of very good isolative kills on the frontline targets. Just melting those tanks. Yorel going to be banned out once again by D9 Black. Not wanting to see those Goomba stomps and the nigh unkillable Jernai Paladin. It's been uh, such a force in that solo lane ever since she's been released. Bone Boy is also sticking with the same ban strategy so far with that Asmodan ban. Asmodan, of course, very good wave clear potential, good split push potential. Just in general, a pain to have to play against right now, so been very high on the ban list for most teams. Diablo going to be banned out here by D9 Black. So a little bit of an adjustment. Not worrying too much about the Garrosh that they banned out last game, but instead taking out the Lord of Terror and not wanting to see any more of that lightning breath. It doesn't smell good, it's true. Hence the name. And my buddy Murda likes to say, you hate to see it. And the Johanna going to be banned out by Bone Boys. So both teams adjusting a little bit on their draft strategies, taking out a couple of these heroes that were played last game, limiting some of those tank options. So I expect both teams to try to draft a tank here early to avoid the chokehold. And there it is. Garrosh going to be coming out for D9 Black. Going to be looking to get some toss kills. Does pair pretty well with the Jaina that they played last game. We'll see if that is their strategy once again. Try and isolate one person and blow them up. Also works well with the Tychus. Balloon, grant us I don't have a horse in this race, but I like their name better. <laughs> That's fair, Ektar. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm pretty impartial as a caster. Of course, you know, D9 Black is our sister team. So you like to see him do well, but at the end of the day, I'm just here to bring you guys the game. So to the best team go the spoils, I always say. Malfurion versus uh, Malfurion and Stitches going to be kind of countering that isolative strategy with the same kind of strategy. Now, of course, Genji is going to be picked up as uh, one of the heroes that don't really mind getting getting hooked. Um, I would say the same pretty much applies to Garrosh. He's generally okay with it. Deckard going to be banned out here for the side of Bone Boys. As they already have their support. Go ahead and apply that support chokehold. Take out one of the better supports for uh, very mobile Genji. I, I say that knowing that it's difficult to throw 
potions at Genji and hit them accurately, but also super mobile heroes like Genji, you just throw the potions out there, and when they're in trouble, they can get to them pretty much any time, you know? That's that's the kind of the, the problem against those mobile heroes. They can always get to safety, and if you've got those potions kind of sitting around, you can get the job done pretty easy. Meanwhile, Gul'dan picked up as well. Massive wave clear potential on that hero. The question for Bone Boys is, is Stitches the main tank, or is he going to be the off tank? So far, could still go either way. No solo laner really picked up yet for the Bone Boys, so they could still decide to make Stitches that main tank. But uh, Greymane, very good on the follow-up here for the Stitches hook into Malfurion root combo. Our time has come. Artanis going to be picked oh, up here for Divine Nine Black, along with Lucio as their main healer. So the sound barrier going to be the attempted counter and, and, and what they're going to try to use to enable the uh, Genji. can be a little difficult as Genji kind of likes to be on an island a lot of times, but I suppose if you pop that sound barrier right before he goes in with either the X-Strike or the Dragon Strike, can be pretty strong. And Lunara going to be picked up here. So interesting strategy from the Bone Boys. Typically... You see Lunara in, spawn, in response to a heavy single target healer, such as an Uther. Uh, Lucio, very good at spread damage to try to counter a lot of the damage that Lunara and Nazebo end up putting out. That said, though, if you have enough of it, it can overwhelm the Lucio's healing, especially before he gets uh, the level 16 upgrade. So we'll see if that does indeed end up being the case here. The wave clear potential also very, very strong for the side of the Bone Boys, which is a premium here on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Real Crafty Devil, what's up, man? How you doing, Crafty? I saw you on earlier. I almost invited you to our game, but then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this game ended up happening. It was, it was very, very close to being a forfeit. Gotta give a shout out to my boy Siege and Divine Nine Black, though, for being good sports and accepting the match, even though their opponents were a little bit late tonight. Gotta love the good sportsmanship that we usually see here in the Nexus Gaming series. And once again, we will see somebody on the potato in this matchup. Just as I say that, though, there go all the loading bars. Right on up. All right. We are loading in here for game number two on Tomb of the Spider Queen. If I can hit my buttons right. There we go. On the left, it is the Bone Boys. We're going to see Captain Bobo on the Malfurion. Tastes rancid. Gonna be on the stitches. Boy, does that fit right. Some scrub on the gray main. Chaos Killer gonna be playing the Nazebo and Arcanaut on the Lunara. On the right, Divine Nine Black. We're gonna see Doggle on the Gul'dan. Nathan gonna be playing the Ar the Artanis. Siege gonna be playing the Genji. Summer Ash on the Garrosh. And MJ gonna be on the Lucio. We'll go ahead and bring these talents up for you right away from level one. Toad build coming out for uh, the Nazebo. Pretty standard across the board. It is going to be amateur opponent coming out here for Artanis. So he's going to be looking for that extra wave clear potential. As Garrosh is already handling the tanky stuff. So I don't have to really worry too much about that. Corruption build coming out for Gul'dan. Which makes a lot of sense when uh, the enemy team doesn't have quite as much frontline potential with that potential Q build. Excited for some Stitches Mouth action, says the Pie Maker. I agree. We've seen a lot of good uh, uh, the, the pull-in root combos 
over the years. It's definitely a strategy that's endured. But uh, also been adopted in with other heroes. And poor MJ just stuck in between a wall and another wall. Wallception there for the frog. And this will be interesting. The side of Divine Nine Black does have an interesting isolative mechanic of their own in the Genji Garrosh combo, where you can speed up the Garrosh, making it easier for him to walk up to somebody and look to get that throw and then isolated potential. But there's not a whole lot of CC to follow that up. You got, you know, you got the boop from, you know, from the uh, Lucio. We'll try and shove him back just a little bit further. But uh, there's just, you know, and Genji and and uh, Gul'dan, it's an interesting combo to try to capitalize off of that. The chase potential for Genji is pretty good though. So we'll see if they're able to uh, finish this up. But the rotation game, definitely going in favor here early for the side of Divine Nine Black. But part of that might be that uh, Lunara has rotated to the bot lane to contend in the solo lane with Artanis while Greymane silently slips to the bottom and a very crafty move gets down and grabs the siege camp. Line 9 Black never saw it coming. And we will see uh, the rotation game continuing here. Meanwhile, the members of Bone Boys trying to rotate out to get the Nazebo stack, so they're also doing the four-man rotate. They're just falling a little bit behind, and of course with the Garrosh on that front line, they're not wanting to get too close in and risk getting tossed in. So for right now, they're kind of just playing the patient game, letting them rotate through here, and letting the waves crash in. But the problem with that on this map in particular, is you end up giving up a lot of turn-in potential for the other team. So Divine 9 Black definitely rotating and dominating this area of the map in that, uh, in that turn-in area, which is really going to allow them to quickly achieve that 50 gem turn-in they want for this first turn-in phase, if that's what they decide to do. Unless Bone Boys changes up a little something here. As you can see yet again, the members of Bone Boys prioritizing the camps instead of prioritizing the turn in. Lunara does manage to get those uh, solo lane gems turned in, which is a pretty big factor. If you can rotate and gank the solo laner on this map before you can manage to get that turned in, it can be a big swing in the first turn in. Got an entire lane worth of gems built up. But right now, Bone Boys rotating in with the camp and a nice zombie wall coming in along with the roots. They get a little bit of damage out, but right now, Divine Nine Black does have the solid sustain coming in from the Lucio. MJ healing everybody up and good wave clear also coming in from the Gul'dan to clear that up. Lickety split while Siege goes up to cover the soak in the top. So right now, both teams Pretty much dead even on the uh, on the XP game, but the side of Divine Nine Black getting a little bit ahead in the turn-in potential and just barely blocked there. Meanwhile, Summer Ash getting isolated on the back end and is he going to live? The heels are coming through. He lives with 20 barely out of range of that cocktail and Summer Ash makes it out somehow. However, Look at the turn in coming in here from Bone Boys. They're going to take that opportunity to slip in pretty much all of their gems. Nazebo didn't turn in, but they still didn't have quite enough to achieve the full turn in. Meanwhile, Divine Nine Black is going to take this positional opportunity to rotate in and get themselves their camp pushing in mid. Meanwhile, between some scrub and chaos, they still... Need, well, and Arcanaut, they still need two people to turn in here. Well, MJ will secure the last of the gems needed and the first turn in gonna go over to Divine Nine Black. Also timed up with this mid camp, but it looks like right now Bone Boys are gonna dedicate all five to getting that cleaned up so it doesn't get too out of hand. 
Meanwhile, Divine Nine Black gonna push up in the top lane. Huh. Well, thank you very much, Dankstrom and Cat Peach. I appreciate it. I have played a game or two, as it turns out. Meanwhile, we do see the first wave pushing in for the side of D9 Black. Nice answer, though, here from Bone Boys. They've got decent wave clear. They're going to come in and push that top lane back out. But now the quick rotation. Five-man rotation coming in here for D9 Black. So they're not getting quite the soak value that you'd like to get off of the first turn in. But they are getting a decent amount of structure damage here in mid. They're going to be able to take down a bit of that front wall. Meanwhile, Stitch is getting tossed over. Once again, you know, not a whole lot of CC to keep them in place there. And he's going to be able to just waltz his way on out. So again, you, talk, you think about the rotation game here, and Bone Boy is able to not only stave off... Well, meanwhile, Artanis getting caught out here in the bot lane. He's going to go down. So he didn't have very many gems on him, but that is going to be huge for Bone Boys as they get very close to level 10. They were able to maintain a level lead despite the fact that Divine Nine Black got that first objective. Because they were able to defend pretty well and not allow too much structure damage. But also had someone soaking in the off lane to get that extra XP. So not they're going to have level 10 here as this first wave pushes in. And Divine Nine Black still an entire half a level from being able to pick up their heroics. So looking at the level 10s coming in here for Bone Boys. They've got Putrid Bile, Thornwood Vine along with the Gargantuan, Go for the Throat, and the Tranquility. There it is. Malfurion just not played that much lately. I haven't I haven't had to call his uh, heroics in a while. I always forget the name of the other one though. That's the real that's the real test. Oh but MJ just getting completely blown up here by that poison. As blown up as you can be by slow ticking poison damage. And yeah, again, Artanis just getting wrecked there. So much damage coming out here from Bone Boys. It's and it's painful damage because it's not very fast. You know, it's not it's not the delete you damage that you get from like a Jaina, but the the damage that's coming out from the Stitches, the Lunara, and the Nazebo, it's ticking so fast that it almost feels like burst damage just insane amounts of dot damage coming out. Meanwhile, level 12 here, 98 stacks for Nazebo. So he's mostly on course to make it to that 175 mark by level 20. And we'll need to do a little bit more work on that, but overall, still very achievable if that is what they're going for, which the level four talent pickup would suggest. Meanwhile, MJ waltzing on in, and Doggo gonna get hit by the root after that hook, and the sound barrier just a little bit too late there. Just a bit outside, if you will. It's gonna be another pick here. 4 nothing for the Bone Boys, as they are on a tear here in game number two, picking up right where they left off in game number one. We're going to see another set of web weavers bearing down on Divine Nine Black structures as they look towards this mid keep. I'm going to get the wall down very quickly here. And one of the nice things for the Bone Boys with this comp lots of wave clear, but also tons of structure damage. And it ramps up. Of course, we all know that Nazebo is a late game hero that gets stronger and stronger as Summer Ash gets hooked in. And blown up, and same scrub. Going to use that reset on the go for the throat to put more pressure on Doggo. But uh, we know that we know that the Nazebo ramps up in damage, but so does the Lunara. The level 16 and level 20 talents that are pretty commonplace for Lunara players, it just puts that poison level on a completely different level. With the unfair advantage and then the nature's toxin. Meanwhile, the mid keep goes down. The top keep is going to go down to a Web Weaver, a Gargantuan, and an Azebo. It sounds like the beginning of a joke. A Web Weaver, a Gargantuan, and an Azebo walk into a bar. 
Meanwhile, we will see the instant rotation of boss here for Bone Boys. So excellent shot calling. They know that they've got this uh, this game on lock right now. They can pretty much go do whatever they want. So they say to themselves, what is the highest risk, highest reward potential thing that we can get while there's pretty low risk of an invade, you know, especially with Divine Nine Black not having that 13 talent tier. The best answer they could come up with with 20 gems in their pockets and not nearly enough for a turn in is to go for the boss. So they do that, they get the boss, and now they can look to push in. Uh, they do have four levels and two talent tiers up right now. So this should be an opportunity for them to go for core, but they are looking for kills. They want to make sure they secure it. And here comes the dive in. And the again, the health bar is looking more green than red right now for Divine Nine Black. And this is the beginning of the end, ladies and gentlemen. Bone Boy is coming out with a very strong performance tonight. The boss is smacking down the core. Bone Boy is just walking in and taking hero after hero kill. 9 nothing, And that is going to be it. Game number two. And the series going over to the Bone Boys. All right. So that is going to do it for us tonight, guys. I'll give you guys a quick snapshot of the stats and the talents and then we are going to head on out to set up the second game of the series where we will be seeing divine nine black versus team skyark so we will be back in just a couple of moments for that thank you guys for watching